was as I was uh, rereading these three final chapters for this weekend, this weekend for today, it uh, struck me that uh, how little Scruton's analysis needs to be updated. And I think that says something. Uh, well, it says several things. It says that he was a remarkably attentive and perspicacious student of contemporary politics and culture. But it also says that some of the pathologies that um, that uh, strike defenders of the Western inheritance and freedom of thought today have very, very deep roots. So there's a tendency as uh, I would think I would I'd say some of these um, categories have become institutionalized, uh, have taken hold of the commanding heights of cultural and even political life. To to see this as something new or something you know, or at least a, a terrible radicalization of already there. But the fact is that these currents of thought have been extremely influential in academic and cultural and even political life for a very long time. And I think that's a, a sobering insight uh, once one comes to appreciate it. Um, one passage in uh, these chapters that struck me as um, not quite accurate was uh, Scruton's claim, which was very true in 1998, that most of the deconstructionists and POMOs, the people in the humanities who were committed in a abstract and turgid and formulaic and dogmatic way, I could go on with the adjectives, to, uh, uh, to um, repudiate the Western inheritance. You know, the humanities are one of the big, I think the transformation, let's say between 1980 and 2000 of humanities departments from guardians of a cultural inheritance to uh, a, a deep commitment to repudiate that inheritance. Um, uh, but yeah, Scrooge was right, I think, when he said most of these people, they were on the left, some of them were paramarxists, some of them were even more lunatic in their political affiliations and affirmations, but most of them didn't care what their students thought. This was essentially an academic, cultural movement that was uh, both very visible in the commanding heights of intellectual life and culture, but also somewhat isolated from the lifeblood of the larger society. That's not true anymore. I think many of the people who are most committed to uh, the culture of repudiation today care very much what the politics or religion or lack thereof of their students are. So um, there's a... Uh, there's a kind of dangerous politicization of, certainly of American uh, cultural and university life that is, and I think British too, that is uh, quite striking. And uh, uh, when Scruton says uh, at one point in the discussion that um, the, the very idea of the intelligentsia, that's a Russian word, uh, it's not good to have an intelligentsia, you know, this this intellectual class that defines itself by opposition, almost nihilistic opposition to the existing order, to cultural repudiation, to um, an insistence that our civilizational inheritance should in no way be reproduced. Well, and, and, and what comes with the intelligentsia of the kind that has sometimes been quite influential in continental European societies, but particularly in Russia between 1870 and 1917 is a, um, uh, a combination of moral and political nihilism that is toxic for society. So uh, Anglo-American society or the English speaking peoples or English speaking democracies as Winston Churchill famously called them, were largely immune from um, the, the most pernicious uh, activity of intellectuals. We certainly had our, 
proto-totalitarian intellectuals in England and America. Think of the Cambridge Five, you know, who became Stalinist plot, spies and all of that. But this was an exception rather than the rule. George Orwell could write in The Lion and the Unicorn in 1940 that the English just were too decent to believe the continental nonsense that there's no such thing as truth and all of human life is reducible to power and the old verities about justice and courage and prudence and moderation were uh, of no interest and needed to be thrown out. But um, it's not 1940 anymore. You know, Winston Churchill in his great finest hour speech of June 18th, 1940 could say that um, the West that he was defending, that was threatened as Br Britain stood alone at the beginning of the Battle of Britain was at once liberal and Christian civilization. In other words, it was bourgeois civilization, but it was also a civilization deeply marked by the Christian inheritance. Even Orwell, very much a non-believer, although a thoroughly decent man could say the same thing in The Lion and the Unicorn. But Scruton notes in his final chapter that the, our bourgeois society has largely emancipated itself from the Christian inheritance. And that that is a big, big difference. So. Um, and in any case, um, there have been there have been some significant changes since Scruton wrote in 1998. But as I said in my opening remarks, nearly not as many as you would think, and I think not as many as you think because the culture of repudiation, as Scruton so suggestively calls it, was already deeply rooted, deeply instantiated in Western and even Anglo-American life. Um, turns out that in these final chapters, Scruton not only provides, I think, a very powerful and affecting critique of deconstructionism with its magic incantations, as he calls it, not only a powerful and compelling critique of the re reduction of the entire human world to, to domination uh, 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 to power relations, uh, but he um, um, he also, uh, I think, suggests an alternative vision, which is rooted in a sense of inheritance, in gratitude, etc. Um, I think mature and free and responsible human beings need to be grateful for our inheritance and we need to understand that we are uh, caretakers of something much broader and deeper than ourselves. You might call this the Burkean moment in Scruton's thought. Uh, Edmund Burke, who I think is a major political, maybe more political than philosophical influence on Roger Scruton, but Burke famously articulated a vision of the social contract that was a, um, a, a great and enduring and permanent uh, contract between the living, the dead, and the yet to be born. And everything in the culture of repudiation, you might say, uh, militates against such an understanding. So um, just one passage, I want to read one passage from chapter 10 on euthanasia before we move on to the text under consideration for today. You know, it's very, uh, it's often the case when one criticizes the youth culture that a certain kind of defensive student or young person says, you're picking on young people. Scrooge is not picking on young people. It's picking on old people who have abandoned their responsibility to pass on our inheritance to the young and left them with um, really with foolishness. Uh, here goes. The youth culture prides itself on its inclusiveness. That is to say, it removes all barriers to membership, all obstacles in the forms of learning, expertise, illusion, doctrine, or moral discipline. Of course, I think many of us immediately say we're not doing anyone a favor by removing those necessary barriers to social, cultural, and political membership. 
for these would be rites of passage, constituting a tacit admission that to be young is not enough, that the world expects something, and that there is a higher stage of existence to which we all must eventually proceed. This very inclusiveness, however, think of the word culture. It's not, we now have the drug culture, the ghetto culture, the rock culture, you know, the culture of s &M, you know, it's, it's limitless, you know, in its uh, uh, capacity for degradation. Um, the very inclusiveness, however, deprives the youth culture of human purpose. And to be deprived of human purpose is to be deprived of human meaning. It remains locked in the pres present tense. So compare the Burkean image of the great primordial social contract with a cultural moment and spectacle where everyone is locked in the present moment and then the, and thus locked, you might say, within the felt needs of the autonomous self. Looking for good causes, spiritual icons, ways of representing itself as legitimate, but without crossing the fatal barrier into responsible adulthood. Well, I think um, that's a very powerful and suggestive passage, but it also reminds us that these rites of civilizational passage and these rites of personal passage are essential to more humanity and essential to the reproduction of our civilized inheritance. They're necessary for our happiness, they're necessary for our soul, and they're necessary for the, the, the sustenance of a, a civilized patrimony. These are all uh, themes that are near and dear to uh, Roger Scruton. So Scruton argues that when we don't have these rites of passage, when we don't have that great enduring contract between the past, the present and the future, we are likely to give way to what he calls strange superstitions, ephemeral cults, fantasies and enthusiasms. And he twice mentions the deification of Princess Diana in the 1990s. Not, I think, because he's trying to be cruel to Princess Diana, because it's very strange that this unfortunate young woman, a failed royal marriage, a somewhat problematic and dissolute private life, was turned into a humanitarian hero and a kind of secular saint. Um, that really is a sign of a crisis, I think, when people replace authentic heroes and saints with ephemeral celebrities posing as modern avatars of heroism. So this theme of rites of passage is going to be very important as we move on. Well, on to chapter 11, Idle Hands. Um, I've already noted that this chapter begins with the discussion of the absence of a continental style intelligentsia in the English speaking democracies for a very long time. Raymond Aron, who I wrote a book on, the French uh, political philosopher, uh, famously wrote a book in 1955 called uh, L'Opium des Intellectuels, The Opium of the Intellectuals. And uh, uh, he, it's really about the, um, this search for this ersatz and pathological search for spiritual purpose and meaning among continental intellectuals who ended up turning, you know, Joseph Stalin, among others, into a uh, god of history, a god of human emancipation. It's, um, you know, again, the English speaking democracies did not suffer the same degree of fellow traveling, the same indulgence toward, there were certainly lunatic intellectuals, uh, or there were people, naive liberals and progressives, Lincoln Steffens, you know, who was one of the muckrakers who exposed bad living conditions in New York and Chicago and did so with a certain moralistic indignation. Lincoln Fe Steffens famously went to uh, 
the Soviet Union in 1925. And when he returned, he wrote, um, I have seen the future and it works. Well, he didn't really see the future and it didn't work, but uh, I think that's more naivete on the part of a gullible progressive. But uh, W.H. Auden, who was, uh, I think, one of the great English language poets of the 20th century, and a man I th think of, um, he, he eventually became some kind of Kierkegaardian Christian, and uh, he was a critic of uh, uh, totalitarianism, but he was ashamed when he published his collected works of poetry, he left out a poem from 1937 about the Spanish Civil War, where he had lauded necessary murder. Well, Auden was embarrassed and ashamed that he had once lauded necessary murder. But there was a continental type like Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, who specialized in lauding uh, uh, fraternité terreur. For, you know, we only find genuine, we only overcome solitude and anxiety, the great theme of existentialism through revolutionary terror from through a terror that produces momentary uh, feelings of, of uh, uh, fraternity. What a bleak view, some incoherent mixture of Marxism and existentialism. That's the, that's the continental intellectual at work. So we were blessed for a long time in not having continental intellectuals, but we got them now. And we got them now partly less because of the importation of Marxism that never really took off in the Anglo-American world, although there were plenty of Marxist intellectuals, but more, I think, through the invasion of the humanities by the kind of postmodernism and deconstructionism that is so lucidly uh, discussed and critiqued by Scruton in these chapters. And you'll know, notice page 125, 126 onward, Scruton makes a big deal of um, the Soisant Huitard, the 68ers, the, uh, who are really the sons and daughters of the French middle class who revolted during the so-called May events of 1968. But there was some version of May 68 all over the um, Western world whether it was students occupying Columbia or earlier the free speech movement at Berkeley, whether there were, there were student unrest in Mexico City and Dakar and Tokyo. Uh, it seemed to be a universal phenomenon, but it was, it was a um, revolt against bourgeois civilization. And it was a paradoxical revolt. In France, the most representative a motto of the Sosa was say until D, until D. It is forbidden to forbid. Now, that has got to be the most juvenile uh, political and philosophical affirmation of all time. Because what is human life? How can there be a dignified, conscientious human or social life without limitation? Uh, and yet, uh, Alexander Kozhev, the Hegelio Marxist theoretician of the end of history, called Raymond Aron in May 68 and said, uh, the students are calling the police Gestapo. But he said, they're not Gestapo, they're not killing anyone. You know, this was a climate of, uh, of where absurd affirmations were taken as an example by 18 and 19 year olds, euthanasia was taken as a sign of great moral uh, insight. Uh, but um, I mentioned the paradoxical character of May 68. With May 68 came, on the one hand, this uh, antinomianism, which is, you know, nomos means law. Antinomianism means a contempt for law, civic law, civilizational inheritance, but also what uh, we might call the moral law following Kant. Um, so the moral law had to go, law had to go overall, tradition had to go, it was all of a piece. At the same time, the Castroites and Maoists and Trotskyites in France, you had the Cooper school, and they were little cells, revolutionary cells. And these 19 and 18 year old, 19, 20 year old middle-class kids were, uh, 
they, I don't think they knew anything about Mao Zedong or uh, the Chinese Cultural Revolution or, you know, tropical communism in Havana or anything of the sorts, but they said they were Castorites. Some said they were Trotskyites. Some said they were Maoists, but all of that, this was definitely a post-Leninist, post-Stalinist communism. It was trying to put together revolutionary fervor and admiration for faraway tyrannies of the left with a thoroughgoing cultural and moral antinomianism. And I think Scruton is very, very good uh, in discussing that moment. If you read one of the early chapters, the early chapters of his autobiographical Central Regrets, you'll see how important being in Paris during the May events, actually for the whole year 1968, was in um, Roger Scruton's political formation. The uh, chapter in Central Regrets is called How I Became a Conservative. And uh, not a conservative in the sense of a foot soldier of the Tory party, although Scruton, I'm sure, voted for the Tory party. That's not the point. The point was he, he wanted to conserve our Western inheritance against those who declared it the enemy par excellence. So uh, there's some, uh, if you want to read more on this, I would recommend the treatments of thinkers such as Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault in uh, Fool's Frauds and Firebrands, which despite the polemical title entails very detailed, very patient, very, and finally extremely critical in the full sense of the term portraits of the various thinkers of the new left and the postmodern left. And I think the latest edition includes the two theoreticians of l'idée de communisme. You see, Marx tells us you can't have separate theory and practice, but the praxis of Marxist, Leninist, Stalinism, Castorism, Maoism, Pol Potism was pretty putrid. So we, we don't pay attention to the, the uh, praxis. We reaffirm the l'idée, the theory. Very un-Marxist but very influential in humanities and some political circles today. So there's very interesting critiques of uh, Badieu and Zizek. Alain Badieu, who's a, a French philosopher who uh, takes Plato's Republic literally as a kind of neo-Stalinist tract. Uh, he's written uh, discourse, he's written uh, commentaries on Mao's discourses from the Cultural Revolution. I don't suggest you read that. Zizek had, always has a wing. He wrote a book called The Defense of Lost Causes. The lost causes include Robespierre, Stalin, Heidegger in 1933, etc. cetera. Um, but he's always winking at you like, am I really defending these monstrosities or is this just a way of épaté les bourgeois? Um, who knows? I don't know. I mean, I think if somebody did it with right-wing tyranny, uh, I'm just winking when I praise Hitler. I think there would be um, a universal uh, demand for cancellation, but Zizek gets invited to, uh, he's, uh, uh, no, no, you know, how many people in a college campus today have heard of Alexander Solzhenitsyn? Not as many who should. How many of them who study the humanities have heard of uh, Zizek? Probably all of them. That says something about our contemporary cultural and intellectual crisis. So um, uh, Scruton says a lot about Foucault. I think it's very much on Mark. He points out that Michel Foucault, um, uh, who wrote a series of, inspired by Nietzsche, these genealogical accounts of punishment and servitude and madness. And the enemy is, in a way, uh, the bourgeoisie. It's the power relations, the domination. You know, usually most people think of liberal society as offering, at least initially, and in profound and important respects, more freedom than traditional society. But Foucault, a little bit like Herbert Marcuse in the 60s with One Dimensional Man, sees uh, liberal society as unprecedentedly, even if deceptively repressive, a new mode of limitless domination, which to quote from page 126, is inscribed in the tissue of society like a genetic code. And Foucault became, uh, um, the, for the cultural left, the anatomist of power and the priest of liberation. 
I suggest you read J.G. Merkler's book on Foucault, which is called Foucault, uh, published by the University of California Press. It is one of the most powerful examinations of the empirical claims made by Michel Foucault about punishment, prisons, medicine, incarceration, etc. Well, let me just say uh, uh, gently that Foucault really didn't care about the empirical facts. His narratives are constructed in a way to uh, buttress a point about the um, eternally oppressive character of power and the lamentably inhuman character of bourgeois society. Uh, I am going to uh, pass over, um, for the most part, uh, Roger Scruton's very erudite uh, discussion of the deconstructionist enterprise of Jacques Derrida, in part because Derrida is um, th very difficult to summarize. Uh, this talk about the difference and logocentrism, um, in part because um, I think Scruton is right that in the end, the Derridian call for deconstruction of the Western tradition and the obsessiveness about the texts that are said to have no inherent meaning, it really demands a kind of um, initiation into a clerisy. But let, let's, let's, say, let's say a couple things about Derrida uh, before I move on. One, uh, Derrida, in a very learned way, one doesn't want to understate, you know, just as Marx famously said before his death, uh, you know, je ne suis pas un Marxiste, I'm not a Marxist. <laughs> uh, Derrida was not exactly an American humanities professor, uh, uh, you know, parroting slogans about logocentrism and deconstruction. And, uh, but he did vulgarize the, terribly vulgarize the Nietzschean claim that there are no texts, only interpretations. And um, uh, Derrida, I think, uh, his work of subversion is most tied to the claim that we are prisoners of speech, that um, speech, language, the word, the logo, so central to both the Greek and, um, and, and biblical traditions, are simply signs, signs that are unintelligible, that are contingent, and that ultimately, ultimately don't point beyond themselves. And, um, you know, a 20th century political philosopher, uh, Leo Strauss, who was, um, along with Eric Vogel and some others, you know, Hans Gadamer, uh, responsible for the serious resuscitation of the study of classical political philosophy. But he said uh, in a very different way that the goal of textual interpretation was to uh, understand a thinker as he understood himself. Uh, Derrida would say that's impossible, it's undeniable. He would say with Foucault that it reinforces uh, constructed power, uh, relations of domination. But he would also say that it is impossible since everything is contingent all the way down. Like human beings simply have no access to the reference, the reference that sp speech supposedly points to. So any kind of realism, and I'm using here realism in a philosophical sense, that there's some directedness or as the phenomenologists would say, some intentionality, directedness of the mind toward the object uh, or thought toward reality, or uh, 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 would just simply be denied. So what's left in either the Foucaultian version or the Derridian version? And they're two different projects, but very much related. I would say the spirit that informs them, emancipatory, messianic, liberationist, antinomian, uh, deconstructive, has an awful lot in common. What's left is to deconstruct. What is left is to, um, in a way, the exact opposite of what Strauss had talked about, 
um, one not only doesn't understand an author as he understands himself or herself, but one actively attributes meanings to a text that are almost certain, certainly alien to the, uh, uh, the author's intention. But again, the idea of an author's intention is when Roger Scruton writes a book on Kant, he, his short little book on Kant that he wrote in four days, uh, Roger Scruton is trying to tell us what he thinks Kant was up to, even though uh, there's a lot of scrutiny in that book. It's a personal engagement that nonetheless is an effort to understand Kant. It's therefore um, a, uh, a more traditional example of interpretation or hermeneutics. In other words, it accepts the legitimacy and possibility of explication to text, of criticism, of passing on of a literary, philosophical, cultural inheritance. I want to read you a passage from page 128, which I think is important because all the masters of suspicion, Marx, to some extent Freud, uh, certainly the Pomos and deconstructionists, they all presuppose that there is something rotten, deeply, essentially rotten about bourgeois civilization. Francois Fure, the great French uh, historian of the French Revolution, but also author of a very important book on the L'idée de communisme, he didn't like it, called Le Passé d'une Illusion, reference to Freud. He said that all the totalitarian ideologies of the 20th century were informed first and foremost by anti-bourgeois hire. They could not imagine anything worse than the bourgeoisie. Um, but Scrooge reminds me, reminds us of some of the achievement of bourgeois civilization. Page 128. Bourgeois society contains features which are or ought to be the envy of the world. A rule of law which stands sovereign over the actions of the state rights and freedoms which are defended by the state against all incomers, including itself, at least an aspiration. The right of private property, which enables me not only to close a door on enemies, but also to open a door to friends. Very beautiful Scrutonian formulation. The mono monogamous marriage and property owning family. Um, now we talk about family, since we deny any normative or natural foundation um, for family and the complementarity of uh, men and women, um, by, uh, by which the material and cultural capital of one generation can be passed without trouble to the next, a system of universal education formed by the aesthetic and scientific vision of the Enlightenment, and last but not least, the prosperity and security provided by science and the market, to invisible byproducts of individual freedom. That doesn't mean that bourgeois civilization doesn't have its discontents, but it certainly has its strengths. And we need a cost benefit analysis of those strengths and not some anti bourgeois ire where spoiled upper middle class kids like the Sans en Uitar throwing stones at the police in Paris in May, June 68, somehow. Uh, identify bourgeois civilization with um, everything that is undesirable and evil in the human world. Um, one thing the deconstructive or postmodern advocates of um, anti-bourgeois ire have in common is this almost conspiratorial view that the freest and most self-critical societies in human history are marked by an unprecedented form of domination. So this leads cultural and increasingly political elites to engage in an attempt to institutionalize and this may be Roger Scruton's most memorable formulation, page 132. One can find it in almost all his books, the culture of repudiation. 
The culture of repudiation involves a repudiation of the moral inheritance of Western civilization, the high culture of bourgeois society, um, and a routinization of what he calls Baudelaire Satanism, you know, a kind of open assault on and contempt for holy things, sacred things. One doesn't have to be a religious believer necessarily to believe that there are holy or sacred things, that there is a space for goods um, and truths above the human will, above human construction. Um, but the whole deconstructivist Theridian Foucaultian project is um, is to is really to take all of the pleasure out of the confrontation with or engagement with I should rather say with a philosophical or literary text or religious text for that matter um, when when the the old texts are seen not as um, places where enduring truths about the human condition can be confronted in a way that draws out all the powers of moral imagination, but are rather seen as instruments of repression and domination, then we enter into, again, remember that reference to Baudelaire's Satanism, we enter into what uh, Scruton calls in chapter 12, the devil's work. All right. And by the way, this is not just a metaphor by, um, by Scruton. Scruton loved to quote. He does it in Human Nature. He's a great book on human nature and elsewhere. The remark of Goethe's Mephistopheles. The devil is the spirit who forever negates. The, the act of negation or repudiation is essentially satanic. And if Satan is the father of lies, as Christ says in the Gospel of John 8, well, what is more satanic or mendacious than the claim that truth, goodness, and beauty are nothing but instruments of an unprecedented form of domination and oppression? Or the belief, as Roger Scruton puts it in the middle of page 138, that the entire human world is a human construct. Uh, that's all there is. I remember Richard Rorty, who was uh, totally inebriated by continental philosophy, but presented himself as an American pragmatist, even an American patriot. But he used to say, oh, everything we believe, everything we experience is contingent all the way down. He even said, you know, death is constructed and contingent. Well, Richard Rorty died. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> to speak very naively, he, we didn't deconstruct them. We didn't, uh, 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 get, you know, uh, linguistically get rid of him, uh, put him out of existence. He died uh, as a human person, as a biological entity, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing that is, uh, life is not, merely constructed and death is not constructed at all. So um, the idea that um, all human relations are simply, uh, Mary Midgley calls it nothing buttery, you know, nothing but power and domination, simply isn't true to human experience. Uh, first of all, the logos may give us access to real truths and real and enduring experiences. Um, it may very well be that the constant evocation of deconstruction and power relations is, as Roger Scruton argues at the bottom of page 141, neither a method nor an argument, but to quote the lines I mentioned before, uh, a kind of magical incantation. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think there's something very theological, not in a sectarian sense, but theological 
A, about Derrida's project, which is anti-theological, and Scruton's critique of him. So instead of the real presence of the sacred, of truth, of the transcendentals, we only have access through the, the arts of interpretation and deconstruction, really deconstruction, to pure negativity. Or as Scruton puts it, and here we're back in Mephistophelian and Baudelarian territory, the real presence of nothing. Or as Scruton puts it, citing the nothingness of Sartre and Heidegger on the top of page 146, the notorious thing that noths, a reference to a discussion in the writings of Marx, Martin Heidegger. Uh, Martin Heidegger, by the way, and even Sartre, I think, are much more serious thinkers than what comes later. But uh, they, too, were complicit in terrible political irresponsibility. Heidegger's um, commitment to, as he called it, the introduction to metaphysics in 1935, the inner truth and greatness of national socialists. And as Aron said, you know, uh, Sartre was an indefatigable defender of political irresponsibility. Uh, uh, you know, uh, one does not read Jean-Paul Sartre. You know, I read Jean-Paul Sartre. There's lots of good stuff in being in nothingness. One can read some of those novels from the 30s, like uh, Nausea, with, uh, they certainly reveal something about the mood of existentialism. He's a good writer, but his political stance is movement back and forth from Marx to Nietzsche, to Stalin, to Mao, to Castro. Gallimard a couple of years ago published his uh, writings on Castro uh, and the Cuban revolution. At one point uh, they were riding along in a car and uh, Sar Castro stopped and got out and he uh, excoriated a little boy who was violating the law by selling lemonade. And uh, cause that's capitalist, you know, two pennies or two pesos for a, a uh, cu cup of lemonade and, and Sar even Sartre said to Castro, aren't you being a little hard on the little boy? Well, <laughs> that's really existing socialism. No private enterprise, no lemonade stands. But anyway, um, yeah, I've already mentioned Sartre's uh, defense in the La Critique de Raison Dialectique of uh, uh, Fraternité Terreur, you know, uh, uh, there's really sort of Maoist or Trotskyite moment in Sartre's thought. But in any case, um, I particularly recommend to you the summary and critique of the deconstructive and Foucaultian ideas, what Scruton, I think, rather cleverly calls deconstructionist theology on page 145. And to sum up very briefly, there is no legitimacy or authority in the world, but only human constructs whose foundation is power. I might, you might say the entire cultural and political left today, the antinomian left, cannot see any difference between authority and authoritarianism. I would say the distinction between authority and authoritarianism is the single most important distinction that is necessary to defend and acknowledge the reality of civilization. There's no truth, but only truth in inverted commas. By the way, the fact that the same people today who don't believe in truth are going on and on that everyone on the other side of the spectrum is pushing fake news and won't acknowledge facts, that's a conundrum worth thinking about. Uh, um, uh, suddenly people have rediscovered truth, maybe for tactical political reasons after 2016. There is certainly no transcendental creator, not only a transcendental creator of the world, but even to come back to my reference to Leo Strauss, even of text. So the very idea of an author's intention. What is Shakespeare up to? What is Aristotle doing in the ethics? What is Kant doing in the critiques? What is Tocqueville up to in his friendly but serious critique of democracy in democracy in America? Those in a way meaningless questions since there is no creator of any given text. And that of course is linked to the claim that there is no intrinsic meaning to the human condition, uh, that um, um, uh, this, there is only the North, there's only nothingness. And so instead of the search for, 
the sacred utterance, the word of God, the holy text, um, the, the deconstructionist project is really profoundly anti-theological because all words and reference that point to truth, legitimacy, authority, objectivity, meaning, and reality are forcibly subjugated to the void. Um, except one, and this is utterly in incoherent. So um, you have no ground for moral affirmation, none at all. The world is will to power all the way down. And yet, um, in this project of antinomianism, the deconstruction of sides with the proletarian over the bourgeois, with the woman over the man, with the gay over the straight. Uh, and why, and why, by the way, if you have some great emancipatory liberationist cultural and political project, why won't the victims very quickly become victimizers, you know, carrying out the will to power and domination? What is it that would somehow lead them to escape the logic of the human world? Um, why are they too not going to be dominated by meaninglessness, by a kind of instrumental rationality, which is cruel and repressive? Why are the power structures uh, whose hold on human life are woefully exaggerated? Why are they somehow going to disappear when the somewhat arbitrarily assigned victims come to the forefront. Scruton ends chapter 12 by saying, and this is, I think, a, a very profound insight. If you really want to see a world where truth has been completely reduced to power and manipulation, read Orwell's 1984, especially those uh, sections near the end of the book where O'Brien, the Machiavellian communist inquisitor, reveals the theology of Ingsoc and totalitarianism to Winston Smith. And it really is the party will control, manipulate, overcome nature, and its power is self-vindicating. Truth is whatever the party says, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the point is clear enough. Um, if we reduce the human world to power, if we negate natural justice, if we succumb to the culture of repudiation, if we reject the transcendentals of truth, beauty, and goodness, if we mock even the high culture of older times as a residue of bourgeois domination, we are not going to end up with some emancipated human freedom we're going to end up with a satanic repudiation of the real. I know that sounds very harsh. Um, uh, Scruton says it with great grace and elan and eloquence, but it is, as Machiavelli would say, the effectual truth. Now, I am going to end very, very briefly by talking about the positive alternative that Scruton catch, uh, sketches at the end of this book. It is surprising. It is certainly not the only positive alternative. Think of the turn toward um, renewed theological philo philosophical reflection in worlds like works like uh, The Soul of the World or The Face of God, uh, quite late in Scruton's life and writings. But here, he puts forward, I think, he's still somewhat operating within the horizons of high modernism. What I mean by that is, I think Scruton thinks, at least within the world of culture, the beginning of a response is to reconnect the aesthetic, the literary, the musical, the artistic, to some sense of the sacred, or even the absence of the sacred. And he has a very good, interesting discussion of Wagner in that regard that I think tied to his, his fuller treatment of Wagner in a couple of books, several books, including the last book on Parsifal. But he does say 
that Wagner remains too much a, a prisoner of romanticism. And you might say that uh, seeing love as the solution rather than love as a profoundly humanizing element of the human world that points to something beyond itself. Most surprisingly for me is the fact that this book ends with the discussion of Confucian. Confucius, the light from the East. Uh, Confucius, I think is of interest to Scruton because he was living at what he perceived to be the end of an old Chinese order. He witnessed the collapse of a traditional moral order, the loss of the piety among the young. And he put forward as an alternative, not transcendental principles, transcendental religion, but a recovery of humanity, obedience, and respect for custom and ceremony, or what Wordsworth called natural piety. I would insist that this is not Roger Scruton's final word, but I would say, uh, I think I touched upon this in some of the preceding sessions, certainly last time, that uh, Scruton doesn't have a single response, you might say, to the modern desacralization of culture and politics and our civilized inheritance. Uh, here, this more mundane recovery of natural piety within the realm of culture and society is put forward. Elsewhere, I think Scruton's aspirations are uh, less uh, intramundane, if I can put it that way. I'm going to end on that note, and we can uh, discuss things until three o'clock.